like wave me down and tell me that I need to like fiddle with things. Anyway, good afternoon everyone. My name is Jack Derner and I'm here today to talk to you about secure stable matching at scale. This is some research I've recently undertaken with my co-authors David Evans and Avi Shalott. And we're going to begin by talking what, about what actually a stable matching is and why it is that you might want to find one. So suppose for a second that you have a bunch of people who are going to participate in a matching. And we're going to call the set of the scaly ones the proposers and we're going to call the set of the fuzzy ones the reviewers. And suppose additionally that each member of each of the sets has a list of ratings over all the members of the other set. So for instance, Snake likes bear a lot better than he likes monkey. And he likes monkey better than horse who he likes better than snail. And horse likes frog the best, followed by snake and crocodile and turtle and so on. And suppose now that you want to create a matching over these people. That is, you want to make a list of pairs so that each pair contains one member from the proposers and one member from the reviewers. There's many different ways to make matchings, and there's many different attributes that matchings can have, but the, ma the attribute we're interested in is stability. This is a stable matching. If you look at the preferences that have been selected for the pro proposers, you can see that three of them actually got their top match. There's no one they'd rather be paired with. The fourth, Snake, got his third match, which is horse. But if we look at the two people that Snake rather, would have rather been matched with, that is, bear and monkey, you notice that both of them actually rated Snake far lower than the person that they were eventually matched with. That makes this match stable. That is, you can't find a potential pairing such that both members would rather be matched with each other than the person that they were eventually matched with. On the other hand, this is an unstable matching. In particular, the instability is here. Both crocodile and bear would rather be matched with each other than with the people they were matched with. And if you match them this way, they may afterwards talk to each other and find out that they both liked each other better than the other person, and then they might break their matches and match off on the side somewhere and leave snake and uh, horse alone and lonely. This simply wouldn't do. It turns out that this concept of stability is extremely useful in labor markets. So much so, in fact, that Alvin Roth and Lloyd Shapley won a Nobel Prize for it in 2012. Today, it's used to match doctors to hospitals every year as well as students to universities and high schools and other countries. There are, however, a couple of caveats in practice, and the most important one is privacy of preferences. Consider this example again. Snake has been matched with horse, but horse is actually Snake's third pick, and horse probably wouldn't be very happy about that if he found out. So Snake probably doesn't want horse to find out what choice he was. And of course, we find this situation in the real world as well. People don't just have preference lists, they have social pressures. And as a result, we'd like to keep their information private. In practice, this is usually done through the use of trusted third parties. That is, people to whom you can send all of your preferences, as well as a generous sum of money, and then they'll perform the matching on your behalf and tell you the results and promise that they did it correctly and that they probably didn't leak anything they weren't supposed to. We propose to replace trusted third, par third parties with secure computations, however. That is, instead of sending your data to some person out in the void, you instead delegate the match to some number of matching authorities who are trusted only not to collude. For our particular research, we're actually going to use secret sharing among two authorities in the semi-honest model, so we're additionally going to trust them to perform the algorithm faithfully. This is relatively well in line with most of the previous work on the subject. Speaking of which, there is quite a bit of previous work on the subject. It goes back about 10 years. These are the earliest works, and they all use custom protocols based on public key encryption and re-encryption mix nets, except, of course, for the last one, as noted. They all also share one other attribute, which is that they have extremely high complexity, at least end of the fourth, possibly end of the fifth. Even the last, which uses Gauss garbled circuits and managed to produce some results in practice, doesn't break through that barrier. So why does that barrier exist? Gale Shapley, after all, is only an n-squared algorithm. We're going to take a look at the algorithm and see if we can extract that information. Suppose, again, that we have a set of proposers and a set of reviewers, and suppose, as before, that they each have a set of preferences over everyone in the opposite set. The algorithm works as follows. You consider the first unmatched proposer. This person looks at the first entry on their list of preferences. And if the indicated reviewer is unmatched, then the match is made, and you consider the next unmatched proposer, and so on. You may eventually reach a proposer who proposes to a reviewer who's already been matched to someone. And in this case, that reviewer has to pick which proposer they like best. 
Here we can see that bear actually prefers crocodile to snake, therefore bear's match with snake is broken and a new match is formed with crocodile, making snake once again unmatched. Gale and Shapley proved in 1962 that this algorithm is guaranteed to terminate after n squared iterations, and when it terminates, it's guaranteed to have produced a stable matching. So specifically, what is the problem that caused n, causes n to the fourth time in this algorithm? Well, as I said, we have n squared preferences in the preference array, and we analyze at most one new preference on each iteration. Therefore, we have to complete this loop n squared times. And in secure computation, you can't terminate early because doing so would tell you something about the preferences, i.e. that there wasn't very much contention. Therefore, you have to actually execute all n squared loops in a secure co computation no matter what. Now we're gonna look at the operations inside the loop. These are memory accesses. These are typically considered constant time in standard computation, but in secure computation, it's not that simple. In particular, the red ones are accesses to the n squared preferences array, which you've previously seen. And all of these are data dependent because on any iteration, the preference that we're accessing is depending on all of the previous matches that have been made or broken. <clears throat> in secure computation, however, you can't simply perform data dependent accesses because an adversary that observed them might be able to tell something about the data on which they depend. Therefore, you have to hide them in some way. And the typical trick is simply to touch every single element in the array on every access. Thus, if you have an array of size n squared and you touch every element, and you perform that access n squared time, you reach a total complexity of n to the fourth. There are, however, some alternative approaches. In the last couple of years, people have managed to combine ORAMs with secure computation. And an ORAM is a sort of data structure that abstracts the physical accesses from the semantic accesses, such that an adversary that observes the pattern of physical accesses can learn nothing about the actual data dependencies. And not surprisingly, there are a couple of works that attempt to solve secure stable matching with ORAMs. The first was Keller and Scholl in 2014. They built a scheme based on speeds and path ORAM and achieved actually a very good complexity. Path ORAM has a log cubed n access complexity, so they achieved n squared, n squared log cubed n, which is probably not that far from optimal. They even managed, managed some pretty good practical results, 128 pairs in under three hours. Two years later, Zahir et al. proposed a new ORAM scheme that actually relaxes the asymptotic complexity, but in turn, it achieves much lower constants and therefore much better performance in practice over a wide swath of the parameter space. They too used stable matching as a benchmark and achieved 128 pairs in 23 minutes or 512 pairs in 33 hours. It's worth noting that Although this is, the, this is the best work to date, it's not really fair to compare these works since they use different underlying protocols and have different security attributes and so forth. So to reiterate this and, and develop some visual intuition, we're gonna look at some actual benchmarks for all of the different methods we've seen. These are taken from Zahir et al. Um, we see first linear scan, that is touching all of the different elements in the array. Uh, quite expensive, you can see for 256 elements, that's something like 200,000 seconds, which is like 60 hours or something ridiculous. Um, then if you pick a tree ORAM, so circuit ORAM in this case, but path ORAM exhibits similar performance in general, you have a much better complexity, but the constants are so high that it actually performs worse for most of the parameter space. And finally, with square root ORAM, we reach a complexity that's somewhere in between the two, but because the constants are so much lower, this is a much faster scheme for the majority of the parameter space. Nonetheless, at 512 elements, it still takes something like 100,000 seconds, which is about 30 hours. And 512 pairs isn't very many. Essentially, it's still a toy problem. Whereas real matches are something like this. In 2016, the National Resident Matching Program, which matches residents to hospitals each year, matched 35,000 doctors with 30,000 positions at 4,800 hospitals. Needless to say, there are a couple differences between this algorithm that they used to do this match and Gail Shapley, but even accounting for those, it seems that we're going to need something like an order of magnitude or possibly multiple orders of magnitude improvement in order to attempt a match of this size. So, what can we do about that? Well, we're gonna to return to Gail Shapley and see if we can gain some insight. Here again is the highlighted code. You've seen this before. We have in the lower right-hand corner some representations of the two data structures we need. And we also have a listing of the access complexity and the initialization complexity for those two data structures. We're here going to focus on the n squared ones. Remember, these are the preferences array, and this is where most of the time is going to be spent. And here is the key observation on which our contributions are, are based. This observation is that these accesses are not actually random. 
Instead, we need to know each, prefer, each proposer's preferences only once and only in order. Because if you remember the algorithm, once a match is made, it can be broken, but it will never be revisited, not ever. Therefore, an ORAM seems too powerful a concept. It allows you to have arbitrary accesses, but we don't actually need that. And ORAMs are full of like stashes and buckets and permutation maps and things like that. And these support things like reading an element multiple times or writing an element after it's been read. And if we don't need any of that functionality, it stands to reason we actually don't need any of those components. And that turns out to be true. We do need some functionality, though. We can't just use a bare array. After all, that's how we got to end of the fourth. So this is the necessary functionality that we have to have. We need a data structure that iterates over n individual lists, one for each proposer. It hides which list is currently being iterated, and it hides how far along the list we've iterated so far. <clears throat> we design and introduce a new data structure that fulfills these functionalities exactly, and we call it the oblivious link multilist. But before I can explain it, we're actually going to talk about a simpler version, the single oblivious linked list, just for the sake of explanation. Remember again, each proposer has a set of preferences over the reviewers, in this case, 10. We're going to represent them in memory like this. And this data structure actually contains all of the information required for all of the pairs of which proposer 1 is a part. You can see in the top row are the indexes of all the reviewers. In the middle row are Proposer 1's ranking of, rankings of those reviewers, and in the bottom row, row are all of those reviewers' rankings of Proposer 1. And these are sorted by Proposer 1's rankings of the reviewers. Now, we're going to abstract this away. You can sort of forget about everything that's in there. You don't need to remember it. But do bear in mind, this has a very specific access pattern. We're going to start with block A, and then move to block B, and C, and so on. We're never going to go back. We're never going to read anything twice. And this is going to be the input to our oblivious linked list. Now, an oblivious linked list works like this. You begin by generating a random secret permutation inside of secure computation, and applying it to the integers from 0 to whatever the length of your list is. You then adjoin those integers to the original data blocks, less shifting by one, and reserving the first one off to the side. This is going to be important later. You then invert that oblivious permutation and apply it to the combined data blocks, and you end up with this data structure. Now, this is really interesting, because what you have is the data structure in which the physical indexes of all of the blocks are decoupled from the original semantic indexes, right? But Nonetheless, each data block contains a garbled pointer to the, the current physical location of the next block in the original sequence. And as you can see, we've reserved off to the side one garbled pointer that tell us, tells us where to start in the sequence. So if we look in block 7, we find block A, which was the first one that we originally had in, in the first array. Um, and if we follow the pointer from block A that says to look in 9, we find block B, which then points to 0, which is block C, and so on. We can generalize this into an oblivious link multilist simply by permuting multiple lists together into a single combined data structure and holding all of their entry pointers off together to one side. We'll need to store these in some other data structure. It could be a, a data structure specifically for this, or we could pack them along with other data that we're going to have to keep track of anyway, which is what we do in our implementations. This data structure has these two important properties, which are exactly the ones we need. One, all of the component lists are indistinguishable at access time. You can't tell from any access which list that access was for. And two, all of, the, all of the individual chains are maintained, so you can follow each one individually to its termination point. <clears throat> As I said, you can access it very simply. All you have to do is reveal one index, find the matching block, reveal the index that comes with that one, find the matching block, et cetera. There are a couple of little details in here that I'm omitting. I encourage you all to look at the paper and sort of see how we solve those problems. Now, this data structure actually has some really nice properties. The complexity looks like this. You can initialize it with a sort over all of the input lists. And if you have n lists, you need n sorts. A batcher sorting network costs n log squared n. So if you're initializing n lists, the cost is log squared n per preference to initialize. In addition, because accessing only requires a reveal, assuming you already have the pointer, the access cost is actually constant. So let's return to Gale Shapely and see how this helps us. We can replace all of the n squared operations 
with our oblivious length multilist. And now we have no ORAMs of a size longer than n. In addition, we've actually improved the asymptotic complexity of, of our initialization procedure, although this term was not going to dominate the final complexity of the algorithm. Furthermore, we can also replace some of the n-length ORAM with oblivious queues, which are much more efficient. These aren't going to help us asymptotically, but they will help us be a bit faster in practice. So with this data structure, let's return to our implementation and see how it helped us. Here again are the numbers from Zaher et al. And using equivalent uh, testing systems, we implemented this and benchmarked it on all the same numbers and got this result, which is with square root ORAM, we get half a degree performance, uh, asymptotic uh, improvement, but we also get 45 times practical improvement at 512 elements. That's a jump from 33 hours to just under 45 minutes. We also recorded YAL gate costs, and, and YAL gate costs are proportionate both to time and to bandwidth uh, for all of the different ORAM types and for all of the different input uh, sizes. And again, you can see about a 45x improvement for 512 pairs. In addition, we were now able to run the experiment for 1,024 pairs, and we found that it was actually cheaper to run 1,024 pairs under square root ORAM with our improvements than it was to run 256 pairs with square root ORAM before our improvements, the total time being only 3.8 hours. Now, this is obviously a significant improvement over what we saw before. But at the beginning of the talk, I promised you secure stable matching at scale, and 1,024 pairs isn't exactly at scale. It's not really even in the same ballpark as the numbers we saw for the NRMP a little, bit, uh, little while ago. So let's talk about how we're going to jump from here to that scale. The first thing we need to acknowledge is that the National Resident Matching Program, and indeed most large matching pools in the world, don't actually use Gale Shapely. They use another algorithm called instability chaining that was invented by Roth Perenson and is sometimes called by their names. And this has a number of differences, but I've called out three that are going to be important. One, Roth Perenson allows you to have many proposers and few reviewers. But the reviewers can all have multiple slots so that they can be matched with multiple proposers. And this matches the, the model of doctors, a lot of doctors, being matched to a small number of hospitals, each of which have multiple jobs open for doctors. In addition, Roth Peranson assumes that each participant only submits a preference list over a relatively small number of the counterparties. They're not actually going to go out and interview with 4,000 hospitals. No one has that much time. And this is going to help us to reduce the number of iterations that the algorithm has to perform. It turns out that our innovations actually can be applied to this algorithm relatively directly. There are a few complications, and we discussed them in the paper, so I hope that you look through the paper and see what we're talking about. In addition, we make a few other optimizations, but I'm not going to talk about those here. To test this, we're going to need a data set. And it turns out the National Resident Matching Program won't release theirs, which sort of makes sense because they're the trusted third party, and that's their job. They're actually doing it pretty well. Um, but they do release statistical information about the matches each year after they perform them. So we took the 2016 statistical information for the National Resident Matching Program and constructed a synthetic data set that we believe is representative of the true data. Some of these numbers you've seen before, the new ones are public bounds that we have to establish for the new parameters introduced with Roth Peranson. This is, of course, because this is a secure algorithm, so you can't just reveal how many preferences each person has submitted or how many positions each hospital has open. There will be, of course, some discrepancies between our data set and, for instance, the distribution of preferences in the real data set. But because our algorithm is data oblivious by nature, these shouldn't be able to impact the results. So with this data set, we ran the benchmark and found that we were able to run a match for a matching of the size of the actual National Resident Matching Program match for 2016 in just over 18 hours. Now, on AWS, this had a cost of roughly $15. We believe that this is well within the time and monetary budget for any organization that actually needs to run a stable matching of this size. So to review our main contributions, we analyzed the secure stable matching algorithm and determined exactly what the minimum requirements for its data structures were. And then we designed a new data, oblivious data structure that satisfied those requirements exactly. In addition, we applied this to a real problem and managed to solve NRMP scale stable matching in a secure computation in a reasonable amount of time. Of course, there are a few caveats that we should mention. As I said at the beginning, we assume a weak semi-honest security model. And the point of this effort is to eliminate trusted third parties. So if we're going to do that, we really need to achieve malicious security. 
The sort of standard refrain for papers like this one, maybe you've even heard it this week, is we believe that our methods can be expand, expanded to achieve malicious security and so on, and we believe that here as well, but we'd like to actually you know, try it before we make any claims. Um, so in the future, that's something we're going to work on. In addition, we don't handle match variations that are present in the in RMP. In particular, couples matching, which is where two romantic partners apply to hospitals in tandem and are accepted or rejected together so that they don't end up getting matched to hospitals on opposite sides of the world. Uh, we don't do that, and we don't uh, handle contingent matches, which is where a single person matches with multiple programs or none at all. It's worth noting that these change the problem significantly. They actually make finding a stable match NP hard, and they remove the guarantee that it's going to exist at all. So in addition to these, there are a few other next steps. One is we believe it may be possible to remove the ORAMs entirely. When we began this research, we couldn't find a good reason why stable matching required an ORAM of size n squared. And indeed, it turned out not to. Having completed the research, we actually can't come up with a good reason why it needs an ORAM of length n. So it could be that with some new ideas about how to approach the solving of stable matching itself, it may be possible to remove the ORAMs of length n. In addition, these new approaches, perhaps combinatorical algorithms or graphing algorithms, may allow us to handle the variations you saw in the previous slide. Furthermore, we'd like to expand the algorithm to address n parties so that each of the participants can participate on their own rather than delegating to matching authorities as this work and all of the previous works have done. And finally, we'd like to actually offer secure stable matching as a service. And we've made some progress toward this end. We have a student right now who's working on developing an end user product so that organizations can perform stable matchings on their own. We have some hope that we may be able to pilot test this uh, for matching the sororities at the University of Virginia during their 2017 rush session. <clears throat> Finally, I'd like to mention that code is available, and you can download it right now as you sit in your seat. If you'd like to reproduce our results, you can reproduce everything you've seen here with these three commands. I highly encourage you to try it. As LeVar Burton would say, don't take my word for it. Um, in addition, read it, understand it, let us know what we did badly, how we can improve, have great ideas. We'd love to hear them. Anyway, that was Secure Stable Matching at Scale. Again, I'm Jack Derner. Uh, thank you for listening, and uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. We do have time for questions. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, I'm Mike Roslick from Oregon State. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I had a question about um, what you said about hiding the, hiding the number of preferences each person has, and you, yes. you wanted to hide that. Does it, does it hurt in some unexpected way to reveal that, or is that just for convenience? Um, well, that's, that's sort of up to the participants whether or not that hurts. I would conjecture that the participants that maybe only have one preference, like they, they probably don't want people to know, or like hospitals that could only interview one person maybe don't want to reveal that information, or if they only have one slot open. Um, but in, in all honesty, this is sort of an effort in completeness. We want to hide every aspect of the input data, so establishing those public bounds is necessary to that end. It certainly is possible, if you want to be able to reveal all of that, to redesign this algorithm such that all of that is public, or even such that individual institutions or reviewers have just theirs revealed, and no one else has to, or so that you have buckets that people can sort themselves into, and so on. Additionally, we actually also have a means, it's not discussed here, it is in the paper, of uh, splitting people who have to have many preferences, more than they can fit, so that they're, like, they're represented by multiple different entities in the system, and, and that way they can fit in under the bound if they're an outlier. Um, but in principle, we don't have to hide that. In practice, we think we'd probably like to. Hopefully that answers the question. Isaac Sheff, Cornell. I'm curious as to whether your algorithm can be parallelized. So as long as you're running it on Amazon anyway, uh, can you just hire 60 machines for 18 minutes each for the same price and uh, achieve the same results? Um, possibly. I'm not going to say it can't be parallelized. Right now, with this implementation at least, the bottleneck is actually bandwidth. And parallelizing bandwidth is a bit more difficult. You have to buy more of it. Um, but assuming you had enough bandwidth and that wasn't the constraint, 
The only limitation is basically garbling speed. So you could parallelize your, parallelize your garbling and your evaluation. All of the gates, of course, in each layer can be evaluated simultaneously. And most layers have a lot of gates in them, so that should be fairly effective. There will be some choke points where you reach the end of a layer and you have to stop parallelizing for just a little while. And by a little while, of course, that's you know nanoseconds time. But um, we haven't done that for this research for the reason that it wouldn't really help us until we can get multiple gigabits of bandwidth. <clears throat> what does actually have to change to make it end party? Um, well, so basically we, we need a different underlying protocol. Right now we're using Yao's garble circuits, which works for two parties. In principle, as far as I'm aware, and I've done a little bit of thinking about this, but we haven't like, analyzed it incredibly rigorously, there's nothing in our method that's incomp like, incompatible with in-party protocols. Of course, we haven't actually tried to build this on in-party protocols, so don't hold us to that. We could find something as we make progress through that. Um, but as I said, in principle, it's only the underlying protocol that prevents that. And most of this is actually relatively portable. Our, inf our implementation is built atop a compiler that can swap the underlying protocol layer actually after it's compiled. You can even change it runtime if you want to. So this is something that can certainly be tried in the future. How do you split the data from the participants to the distributed, trusted uh, third party? You asked the question. I have a bonus slide for you. Um, <laughs> so. Because we're in the semi-honest model, we can do this really simply. We, all we have to do is use XOR sharing. Each party takes all of their preferences and XORs them, and then just sends one half to each of the computation parties. And of course, they pad out their thing with some dummy preferences so that everyone looks like they have the same number of preferences, and then these dummy preferences are, igno are ignored once they're re reunited inside the secure computation. In principle, pretty much any secret sharing scheme is compatible with this, at least in the two party and you know you can split among two people. Um, but we viewed XOR sharing because it's simple and cheap and, and we don't need anything else due to our security model. Further questions at this time, then thanks again.